Based on my recent experiences in the storm, I have a subject matter that I would like to address, and that is what I call when orchids go into panic mode, what do they do? What can they do? And what can we, I in my case, do in order to help them at least attempt to survive? Now the orchids have been around for many, many, many millions of years and they've actually really evolved in a remarkable way in order to ensure their survival. And one of those factors is if they're stressed or in panic mode or they feel their decline is nigh, they will actually produce spikes in order to throw out the flowers, get them pollinated, in order to ensure their survival. Now, in my case with my Vanda Chao Praia here, I have a classic example because it fell over the first time and caused a break in the crown. Let me see if I can scoot that around a little bit better. It caused a break in the crown here, but the break is not all the way through. So I haven't actually in any way intervened with this break. Just been watching it. I don't see any rot. I don't see anything happening that's going to be detrimental to this orchid. What I do see happening, and she has not bloomed for me in two and a half, almost three years, is that she is chucking out spikes at a rate of knots I have not seen before. And that is from that stress up there that her crown was broken, interfered with, and you can see that on the top, there's not really much going on. Another leaf is growing, but we'll have to wait and see if that will even amount to anything. But the spikes are coming thick and fast. I have four here, and I see another nubbin down in there, in the crack itself. But whether she is going to manage to bloom all four is another question, simply because it depends on the time of year and the strength of the orchid. Now the strength of the orchid in this case is phenomenal because she's got roots all the way down, growing root tips, etc. So I could fertilize her, make her happy, and it wouldn't be an issue. The time of year could be the issue as it's getting colder. We're now into December and I'm not entirely sure if the temperatures are going to be something conducive to blooming. Needless to say though, this is a very, very classic example of what orchids will do in order to ensure their survival after they've encountered some form of stress. It's very obvious in Phalaenopsis as well. The ones that we get from big box stores, the complex hybrids, when you get them in and they bloom and bloom and bloom and extend their blooms and keep on blooming, it's not that the orchid is always a strong specimen. It's actually sometimes panic mode and she will bloom and bloom until she finds that maybe, you know, she gets pollinated or the entire strength of the orchid gets depleted. And then it's like, why? She was blooming so nicely. Now my orchid is dead. It's because they take an extraordinary amount of energy to push spikes and bloom and continuously bloom. So a lot of blooms in certain circumstances is a sign of stress. And then we, what we can do is eliminate that stress by cutting flower spikes, by repotting, and by making sure that we give the orchid some rest time in order to gather up strength and grow roots, which is also quite the energy consumption. So with all of this intro, my Chao Praia is strong and healthy, and I am here just to watch and observe whether she will bloom out of curiosity, whether she can handle it, and because I've never seen the bloom. So, you know, she is strong, she has roots, she can take the stress up here. So let's go down a little bit further and look at what happened in the recent storm. And there is a clear crack. You can see where that leaf is bent. There's another crack right here. It is only just recent. And uh, yeah, the upper part of the orchid is strong and can survive on its own lots of roots if I were to chop it off. The lower part of the orchid is also strong. Lots of roots, some growing root tips, and down in the bottom I have it in a kind of full water culture. The long extended roots are permanently in water and they are growing some really nice root tips as well in the water. 
So I'm not concerned. And I'm not going to chop her off. But what I have to do is try to secure the fact that she is not going to rot on me. Now I can already see that that area is pretty, pretty dry. So I'm not concerned that there's any rot yet. But to be 100% sure, I'm going to get my dragon's blood and a cotton disc because I have no other way of entering into that area to secure the fact that get some disinfectant in there and make sure that no fungus or any kind of pathogen takes my orchid down during this time of year, which is much, much higher humidity than I normally would have. So I'm going to get all that together and let's do this. So thank you very, very much for joining me. I appreciate it. It's a beautiful, beautiful December day. Nice and toasty back here on my west side where this orchid currently lives. Now cuts on orchids are usually treated quickly, efficiently with brown cinnamon. So why am I using dragon's blood? And yes, I'm wearing gloves because this stuff is, wow, it stains badly. But in this case, I'm going to use dragon's blood because I want to make sure that I get into the entire crevice with my cotton bud and I will leave it there for as long as I feel it takes to make sure that everything has soaked and drenched in. So this looks terrible, I know, but needs must. And I hope that I can get this on film because I have a little skewer here as well with which I'm planning to guide the cotton disc in. I can see that it's far too big. So what I'm going to do now is just remove a little bit of it and see that I get it into that crevice and poke it straight through because I can see that there is a clear cut. I can see the other side of the mount through this break here. Alternatively, I could just cut the stem and put cinnamon on both sides of the clean cut. I'm not quite happy with how that's going in, so we'll just keep maneuvering it. And the fact that the cotton bud is drenched is absolutely fine. If you're using dragon's blood, make sure that if you're doing something like this, unless you don't want hands that look like you've murdered somebody, make sure you wear gloves. I have now become so accustomed this season to not wear gloves when I repot and do all that kind of stuff. But with this kind of mess, especially dragon's blood, it's very much advisable to use gloves. All right. You can see how it drips down. It's really, I mean, it is what it, you know, the name says it all, dragon's blood. It really looks bloody, but it is effective. Especially if you have a hollow like this, as opposed to a clean cut. So what else can I do to help this orchid along? From the stress factor, I can use a lot of calcium and magnesium because it has roots and it absorbs the nutrients because of the roots. What I have made a mistake on, and I will show you now as we transition over to the next point, before we transition over to my other example regarding the calcium magnesium, this is a cut with cinnamon on it, as is this. From the recent storm, I cut the tip of the crushed cane and I really, really went to town on the cinnamon. And you can see the drying effect on the bottom there it's getting yellow and that is exactly what we want to see if that was still brown or going black or something that would be danger par excellence and you would immediately want to go down another node and just keep cutting and applying cinnamon until there is no more signs of infection whatsoever and that is how you can help some canes to recover it is too late in this time of year for the, any kind of reaction of basal growth because the season has gone by. But that is another thing that you will notice 
with panicked orchids, stressed orchids, if they have enough strength, they will start chucking out basal growths or cakeys at a rate of knots. Let me go back to my example of when it comes to calcium magnesium and roots or lack of. So here's my little tray of telumnias. I did a video on them, not just, well, just a couple of days ago, regarding what is going on. I have some that are doing really well and some that are absolutely not looking the way they should after two years. Well, it turns out, thank you for all the comments and I really appreciate that. I went and looked at my own video and stood back and pretended they aren't mine. And I was looking at my video out of the eyes of somebody needs help and I was watching every single little detail and then I realized when I heard myself say 300 parts per million every day during the summer, I was like, are you crazy? So many of the roots burnt and there is no access to nutrition on burnt roots. You see the roots down there? Now, yes, they can be old roots, but these are burnt because happy roots look totally different. But what was I doing? I was pumping calcium magnesium onto the weak plants that had absolutely no roots at all during a time of day where their stomata wasn't even open. So foliar feeding was right out the window because that is something else you can do, foliar feed, but it has to be at the right time of day. So thin leafed orchids, oncidiums, and all those that have kind of thin leaves, even an area, they will open their stomatas during the day. And if there's a twinkles, if there is a weak twinkle, for example, with no roots, fold your feet away at your leisure, heart's content, make sure that it has enough aeration, that you don't get any rot, and fold your feet. The hard, flesh, fleshy kind of leaves, they open their stomata at night. Tolumnia leaves are fleshy. So I, I, I created a problem by burning roots, even though I was watering two or three times a day, and then the subsequent waterings were with fresh RO water. The damage was already done because in our summers it is hot and it dries very quickly. And they have no way of absorbing 300 parts per million. So I killed my Tolumnia roots, and then I thought the plant was weak, and I perpetuated the problem by putting more calcium magnesium on them and they have no way of absorbing it. So the mineral buildup is there, which is awful for roots. Everything was just going worse and worse. I was making the problem worse. So in this case, it's just plain RO water with seaweed is what I would now recommend simply because of what I've noticed. And you can see that there is substantial development and improvement already on some which is pretty amazing. So in stopping the feeding on orchids that have no roots that to work with, and just flushing them with RO water, I gave them an Epsom salt soak. You know, there's still a lot of salts on the lava rock, but bit by bit, just RO water. And for me, quite an important component on weak orchids is seaweed, simply because of the growth hormone that seaweed has. But this is just the results after a couple of days. So orchids are resilient, but they can only take so much abuse where they might not have the strength to bounce back. Like with this one, I may have actually left it too long. I do have little new growth, and I hope that now they can develop some roots without me burning them off. So that is how you can help orchids without roots. Foliar feeding at the right time of day, and giving them the aeration to be able to dry out between the nooks and crannies and using seaweed, which has some great properties, especially with the growth hormones in it. This is my Holcoglossum kimberlianum, another example of what orchids do when they go into panic mode. I hope that you can see it against the brown background there. But I have one stem, one main stem, growing up and up and up and up and up, ending here. And this stem just kept growing and growing and was almost twice the size of, you know, twice the size of the choya log, like it would have been up here. But I cut the stem because it already has its own roots. This applies for a rhizome cut as well. Same thing will happen. 
I cut the stem in order to share my plant with Fernanda from Fernanda Nacimento Orchids and Succulents. And right below that, it's growing another shoot. The main stem has two plantlets, three actually, there's another one down here. So in the last two years, it has grown three side shoots. They are all now viable with their own roots, but because there was some stress and its own natural panic mode kicked in, it's going to fight for its survival by sending out another shoot. And that is the same principle by which cattleyas or lalias would go if you were to do a rhizome cut, always ensuring that there's plenty of roots in the pot and having enough substance of storage pseudobulbs in the back in order for the orchid to be able to promote a new growth. If you cut and the orchid is weak in the back without roots, then it could be an issue. It can be done. It can be done, but it could be problematic. Another stress-inducing issue are pests. Uh, there's no two ways about it. If you've got a weak orchid, pests attracted are attracted to weak orchids like a magnet. I don't understand it, but you know, I wouldn't find them as tasty as new growths. Mind you, new growths are also very vulnerable to pests, but an already weak orchid, a struggling orchid, watch out for those pests. If you have a weak orchid, just know you need to not only be on top of it with regards to foliar feeding and getting some strength into the orchid, but, you know, watch out for those pests. So on this lower shelf here, I have some tolumnias that are stressed. My Tetratonia Dark Prince has been stressed from Jump Street and has always had an issue with scale. This morning I saw two more, so it got quickly treated. And then I also noticed a mealybug and that needs to be addressed straight away. There is no waiting, there is no anything like, oh, I'll get back to that later. The minute it is there, visual in your eyes, then it has to be dealt with. No ifs, no buts. For the sake of the orchid and for helping the orchid, get those pests out. You may not be able to control them straight away or get them all eradicated straight away, but you can at least deal with the ones that you see immediately and segregate your orchids from the rest. Now I have a really soft little brush here, doused in alcohol, thank goodness that is the mealybug. I've already treated the orchid once again with my insecticidal soap that I have, um, the organic one. I'm gonna put up the names of its ingredients and components because I'm sure the brand isn't something that is international, but it seems to work quite well because I've had to treat my Tetratonia dark prints quite a lot and normally orchids would go downhill fast if they have to keep, you know, being treated for with pesticides. And um, this one's doing okay. So two more scale, it is now off the main shelf. It is down with my segregated ones. And another thing you can do to help set back and stressed orchids, not only to manage, control the pest issue, is to keep them protected from their normal culture i.e. my Brassabole hybrids here, they need a high light environment to grow and be happy. I can't do that if they're stressed. I would just add and compound the problem. So they are somewhat exposed to the elements, all of them down here because the terrace door is open on a lovely day and then it is closed, but they definitely do not get any harsh direct sun. At this time of year, I have maybe half an hour of a slight angle of a morning sun and then that's gone. So you want them to have enough light in order to photosynthesize and try to get energy and sugars going to regenerate. And you want to make sure that you keep them totally pest free as best as possible because it's very hard sometimes when orchids are segregated to actually be on top of them because they're kind of out of sight. In my case anyway, I don't want them any near the rest of my collection. So they are kind of out of sight. Now I've seen something here and I wonder, yep, that was a scale. That was a scale, past tense. But that it's just every day, I actually have to concern myself with these weak orchids more than I do with all the other ones that are growing super vigorously. Let me show you burnt roots on tolumnias just to give you 
another look. This was my doing. This was a Tulumia that was doing really, really well this summer. Really, really well in inverted commas for, you know, considering how I got the orchid. And it tried with two, two new growths. And I have a third one coming right here. But I was pushing it, trying to get its strength up and putting calcium magnesium on roots that had already burnt off. So the orchid was not getting any benefit whatsoever. It was declining and yeah, now it is possibly a pest magnet and I need to be careful with it. So all of these have got now the regime. I'm trying to help them with just plain RO water and just seaweed. And we'll see if these little growths have the energy to actually produce some roots. So there's that. Just a quick example about other things that can cause orchids to go into panic mode and how we can help them in order to grow strong again. Dendrobiums, a classic example that I like to use when it comes to how an orchid responds when it is stressed or about to die. And look at these canes. This is my Dendrobium tangerinum. And it was on the way into the bin and I was about to put it into the bin bag when I saw little green nubbins at the top here. And I'm like, you are kidding me. After two years of nothing, I was about to bin it. And then there was, you know, so I thought, okay, let's see what you're going to do. And this orchid clearly arrived very stressed and I thought I was going to be able to save it. So I waited for two years and then I was giving up and then boom, as a mechanism for survival, it will chuck up keikis. And orchids don't necessarily chuck up keikis just because they're stressed, but it is a signal for survival. What are they doing in order to make sure that they survive? And I can tell you, what can we do about it? Well, we can make sure that the keikis get enough moisture, enough humidity. In my case, I now have some roots and I have them on a hob material that I keep wet. I have not introduced seaweed to these roots just yet, but you can see I'm getting some burning here. So I may have been too harsh on the pH. The pH is very, very important. Seeing as there's no need to be absorbing any nutrients at this point in time, there is also no need to go mad on a very acidic pH. It is super important to actually maintain the roots via humidity only because they don't absorb as such uh, in the beginning anyway. They need to grow before they can absorb. And one root has already gone into the material, but all I'm trying to do now is maintain a level of humidity on this hob material in order to ensure that the root doesn't keel over on me. Very, very cautious watering and definitely keeping the pH at around 6.5 this is not about absorbing nutrients. This is about making sure that the orchid and the last amount of strength that it is using by producing little leaves and roots, we don't kill that off. And I was very close with my burnt root over there. It's just the velamen. I'm lucky I got away with it, but that's what we can do. Very humid environment. Let the roots find their way and just keep fingers crossed that we've got the balance right because the orchid is trying to survive. This is how we can help. A classic example regarding keikis and stressed orchids, another dendrobium. And I'm just bringing this up because it's more obvious than my little dendrobium tangerinum. This is a complex hybrid nobly. Uh, it's nothing special. It is in my eyes because it's the only one I have. And it is my sort of test orchid to see if I can prove somewhat what my theory is behind the stress and how long it takes for this kind of a dendrobium to acclimate. I, let me just disclaim that in my environment and my Mediterranean climate, it may be completely different elsewhere because the climate where the orchid came from and then is introduced to as its permanent home and grow area, could be exactly the same as in the nursery. And then it's like, I don't have any problem with this orchid at all. It just took off and grew, which is fantastic. Now in my area, 
I have extremely dry summers, very hot, and I don't have the humidity that can be attained in a nursery. So whenever I bring an orchid home or I get one in a box, it has to acclimate before it actually comes in and unto its own. The same with my little complex hybrid rescue nobly here. My first year, of course, I had the blooms, well, the remnants of blooms because it was the rescue, on these beautifully grown long canes. And I'm like, okay, will I be able to replicate these? That's the plan, one day. So the first year I had this orchid, it grew keikis left, right, and center, five of them. And I'm okay. I was like, yeah, I didn't kind of expect that. I thought maybe one, you know, two by pushing it, but five. So this orchid was super stressed when it came into my collection and it threw out keikis. Needless to say, because it is one of these complex hybrids, all my little keikis bloom. So that, it wasn't like there was a problem. It just looked like a, it was an upside down binned bunch of flowers because of the stakes that were growing out of the top and all the flowers were down here. So it looks like somebody, you know, threw a bunch of flowers in the bin. And then I thought, great, that's year one. Year two, let's try something else. This year, the keikis will form basal growth and they will grow big and strong, just like, you know, the previous ones. Well, no, I have one almost, almost big, like the other ones. And it's a basal growth, which is important for me because that means less stress, the orchid has accl acclimated and now it's getting onto, you know, growing the way it should from the base as opposed to stress keikis. But the other canes that I have were not as big. So, you know, I still have in year two not achieved what I got the orchid with. And this is by no means a large Dendrobium nobili. There are noblies, they have double the height of cane. I'm just happy if by year three, I can somehow prove to myself, and hopefully it is correct what I am assuming, as opposed to me not getting the culture right, that on year three, I will get and be able to achieve canes as original. And that my orchid has gone out and away from the stress factor. No more panic mode, it can just grow on. How am I helping it? Well, I took the keikis off and I potted them up. I relieved the canes of the energy it was exuding on the keikis. Once they had roots long enough, they went straight into the pot. That's the one thing you can do with keikis on a stressed orchid. If you want to be able to grow them on, then wait for roots, but get them off as soon as they have their own roots. If you don't want to grow them on and you're not bothered, get them off straight away so that the orchid doesn't waste energy in trying to grow those keikis. So that is a method of how to help a stressed nobili or a dendrobium with regards to their keikis. There are dendrobiums, of course, that also throw out keikis, but they're not stressed at all. And that would be a dendrobium of phylum, for example. Blooms, we always want blooms and I'm always on about blooms and it's nice to have a first time bloomer or a re-bloom, it's whenever, blooms are great. But blooms can also be a sign of stress. A sign of stress, the orchid is trying to just fight for its survival, it has to bloom in order to get pollinated, etc., etc. Phalaenopsis are classic, I mentioned that earlier. This is my twinkle cinnamon. It is not established in the pot. There is some resistance but there's none on this side of the plant at all. This bulb as well. There's a little bit more resistance on this side than there is here. So what we can do with this case is take off flower spikes. And I have, in the beginning, I thought what I'm going to do is I'm going to lead, cut off all the flower spikes because, you know, I can see them again next year. I want the orchid to be strong. But seeing as I have roots on this side, and this bulb doesn't seem to be very solid in the pot. I'm going to leave these flower spikes to bloom, but I'm taking off the flower spikes on the bulb that is using energy from the other side. I'm not going to allow that to happen. So how can we help? Cut the flower spikes. This way I can actually say, yes, I'm going to enjoy some cinnamon blooms, which are great. I look forward to them. But on the other hand, I'm also protecting my orchid a little bit from exuding so much energy that she is going to do herself in. And I don't want that. 
So there is another little flower spike right in the back here. I'm not going to let that happen. So why didn't I cut them earlier? This is cutting the spikes at this point when they've branched. That's a lot of energy has gone into creating these spikes, a lot. But it is important because in my opinion, if you let a spike come out and cut it off too soon, you actually risk the orchid throwing in more energy into creating a subsequent spike just because it needs to bloom because it's stressed and it wants to survive. So I hope that makes sense. Once you get them to branch, that's when you cut them off, in my opinion. And that is what I'm doing in this case. So I can actually get the best of both worlds. I'm protecting it from exuding too much energy and I have, I'm going to see some blooms, which is great from the strongest part of the orchid. But this side is now not leaching from that side and can take a rest. I'm just going to wrap this up with one more example because I think the video is already quite long again. But anyway, sorry about that. Thank you for sticking around and staying tuned. This is the little Phalaenopsis I call Walter Jr. because it's a keiki from a fowl that was super healthy or still is super healthy and it had enough strength to put out a keiki. Whereas a stressed orchid can also put out a keiki but that is also depending on how strong is it in the pot. So you can differentiate the two. Strong in the pot, it pushes out a keiki, happy days, you've got two. You don't have to take it off. Bad in the pot, it pushes out a keiki, that's panic mode it wants to survive. In this case, I had a strong mother plant pushing out a keiki and we put it into colomy as an experiment. Quick update, I've got a root that's trying to grow up and out, which is a bummer, but we're gonna let it. This one, I still can't tell whether it's gone into the media or the root tip has just stopped. This one looks brown, but underneath everything looks healthy and happy despite a lot of algae and I don't like the algae and that is what we were kind of looking for as well because of all the things that Colomy proclaimed to be like the holy grail of orchid substrate. Caution, it will do the algae thing. However, back to subject matter. Look at that, I have a spike coming out of this keiki and then let me close my secateurs here, let me show you. And then, look, here is a spike that I had cut off after it came from the mother plant and I originally had it potted up in semi-hydro. You can see that lecker bead right there. And I cut it off, but it hadn't branched. And I thought, no, I'm, you're not going to be spiking or anything like that. I want you to focus on getting accustomed to semi-hydro and grow roots. Now, there's no way this orchid is strong enough to spike and bloom. So in my opinion, this orchid is in stress mode because from the same node, it's growing another spike. And it hasn't grown any leaves. If this spike was growing after two more leaves had developed, I would say, okay, now we're into blooming phase, good stuff. But this spike down here, for me and in my interpretation, this is a stress spike. Once it is long enough and has some signs of maybe buds pushing, it's coming off. I'm not going to let this orchid bloom. And as this is the colony experiment, I think it's quite a good thing to just throw that in there because I am under the assumption that this is a stress spike and we are gonna follow the evolution of this orchid with the spike and then see how it develops and when I cut it off. So there was lots of little pointers here in this video, but let me show you one more thing. This is my last example right here. This is my Dendrobium aphyllum, crushed canes from stormy winds. And what you can do to help it to recover is apply splints as I have done. This has now been how many days? Uh, maybe two, three. And I cannot see any deterioration of the canes from below the breakage point. Let me see if I can get you in. You can see that this cane right here, it's quite twisted. And this one was quite crushed. 
but the splint seems to be holding it together in the structure of the cells quite nicely. Now a phylum will lose their leaves. So all the canes that are crushed are losing leaves quite quickly. And yes, I'm a bit concerned as to how quickly after the damage they are losing their leaves. So maybe it's preempted in my case to say that the canes will survive. But this is normal anyway for this time of year. They will lose their leaves. But you can see they are the first to actually go. I have some here. The leaves are still yellow. They're still firm on the cane. These guys shriveled up very, very quickly. But if you have an orchid that hasn't been severed completely, try to help it to recover and recuperate by using splints. Oh my goodness, I just wanted to add something else. If you don't have any wood or wire around or anything like that, straws. If you have a straw and then you cut it like one side across, then you can wrap a straw around a break. Now, in my case, I didn't have thick enough straws at home. I tried that method at first, thinking my little thin straws will do at least the, the major part of support before I could do more next day, but it wasn't good enough. If you have thicker canes, like in my case, there's a big smoothie straws, you cut them lengthwise and to size, and then you can splint them just using the straws. So I sincerely hope that was somewhat useful to you. Uh, I don't like to have these examples to be able to show you, but on the other hand, if they help and somebody can do the same and be successful in saving and helping their orchids to recuperate, then I'm all for a teachable moment like this. <laughs> Thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video. I hope it wasn't too long and I look forward to hearing what you do to help your orchids in the comments below. Have a wonderful day. Take care, stay safe, bye.